We <clears throat> come now to the 32nd study period of this camp meeting here in British Columbia. This is the 7.30 presentation on Friday evening, the 31st of August 1984. Now we've covered and completed the course, the main theme for this camp, and I have been requested to give a review in the remaining hours of the message on child salvation and child training. This was first presented in the British Columbian camp last year. We didn't do it down in the Californian camp where I shall do it again this year in full. And then at every camp thereafter it was presented, the message of child salvation and child training, uh, with the emphasis, emphasis on child salvation. I'd like to emphasize that particular point because, as I said last Friday night in that little brief survey I gave of uh, advanced points, before I got to Europe this year, a number of the parents had, uh, of the English-speaking parents, had obtained tape recordings of the camp, I think, in Arkansas last year. And in addition to that, Andreas had prepared a small, uh, a, 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 a brief message on the subject, which, which he sent around the field in German. And everywhere I heard the people talking in expectation of studies on child training or child education, Kinder Erziehung, as we say in Deutsch or German. And I took pains to correct this misinterpretation because there are two aspects to this message. First of all is child salvation or revival, followed in turn by training, which is reformation. And the very same principle which applied to this works so far as parents are concerned also applies so far as the children are concerned and there can be no true reformation without there first of all being a revival which is regeneration. So let's begin, we have only three or four sessions left to spend on this. Tomorrow afternoon of course we have the Lord's Supper at four o'clock. So we have this and three other presentations to cover this very large subject. We turn back to Proverbs 22 and verse 6 to the well-known statement made by the wisest man who ever lived outside of Jesus Christ himself, Solomon. He made, and, and speaking by inspiration, he um, conveys to us this very beautiful promise. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, if there's one thing that we ought to have learned during the years of the, the development of this message, it, it is that we never question for one moment the certainty of God's promises. If we don't find the promise working, we don't uh, lay the charge to God, but we maintain a steadfast faith in the fact that when God makes a promise, that promise is absolutely valid and it will be fulfilled provided the conditions are met. And if the promise is not fulfilled, then the conditions just simply have not been met in one way or the other. Now I had the experience in Germany, there was an English speaking German lady who came to talk to me after one of my studies and uh, she was asking questions about um, the gospel and what we believe in that respect and somehow the conversation drifted to the subject of child salvation and uh, I quoted her this particular text while she, she said that, um, well we know she said the promise doesn't always work because we've trained our children the right way and they just have not gone in God's way thereafter. Therefore, the promise she intimated was unreliable. I said to her, have you ever thought to question not the promise but our application of it? That's where the fault really lies. Now, as we know, of course, there are tens of thousands of uh, religious people both in and outside of the Adventist church who have believed in this promise, who have had a very deep love for their children, have longed to see those children grow up in the way of the Lord and have very diligently trained them in what they thought was the way they should go. They have uh, given them very carefully selected their diet so as not to promote uh, a, a fevered disposition or a, or a stimulated disposition. You know, there's a very close relationship between a simple diet and an even temperament. Sister White says in a very fine statement that if... Uh, the Israelites had eaten in their, in their wilderness journey the diet of the Egyptians they would have been just as unmanageable as the modern generation is today and when you think of the highly inflammatory foods and drinks which are consumed by the modern generation it's, it's no wonder that we have 
strikes and riots and other aberrations of human nature from time to time. So these parents have given their children very carefully selected simple diets. They have um, played with them, they have taught them memory verses, take them to Sabbath school and be, and, and be sure to take them to uh, or send them to church school, to academy and to Adventist colleges. And then in almost every case, there have been exceptions of course, to the utter consternation, bewilderment and, and disappoint, disappointment of the parents, they found that when the children have reached the age of 15 or 16 or 17, that they have gone right out into the world. They have become uh, quite irreligious. They have abandoned all the principles taught to them. They have taken them worldly diets, food and drink and so forth, and have literally broken their parents' hearts. And the question then arises, how could this ever be? They said, we did train their child up in the way he should go, and now he is old, he has departed from that way. And every appearance suggests that the promise was not valid, that God did not mean what he said, and therefore the system doesn't work. I want to suggest tonight that um, there has been a very, very important element missing in this particular program, an element which, without which, of course, the children have not really been trained up in the way in which they should go. Let's turn first of all to Acts of the Apostles, page 12, where we find the kingdom of God being described in these terms. And this is a very beautiful statement, to say the least of it. Uh, actually, we find something of the same words in Christ's object lessons, where Sister Wise is commenting upon the mustard seed. Now, this, uh, I prefer to read this statement there because it has a sentence not found in Christ's object lessons. Whereunto asked Christ shall we liken the kingdom of God or with what comparison shall we compare it he could not employ the kingdoms of the world as a similitude <clears throat> in society he found nothing with which to compare it earthly kingdoms rule by the ascendancy of physical power but from Christ's kingdom every carnal weapon every instrument of coercion is banished there's the difference, or at least one difference between earthly and divine governments. Earthly kingdoms rule by the ascendancy of physical power, so the strongest is in command, but from Christ's kingdom every carnal weapon, every instrument of coercion is banished. Now then, once we have this definition of what an earthly kingdom is and what a heavenly kingdom is, it's not difficult for a family to decide whether their home is an earthly kingdom or a divine kingdom, is it? If, for instance, we, if, for instance, the parents are ruling, if they rule at all, and of course, many homes are simply anarchic because the parents are not in control and the children run, run their parents pretty well. But we're talking now at least where the parents are in command and, they're, and they are actually affecting a training, the children are not coming up untrained or undisciplined, because the statement we're looking at says train up a child in the way he should go and therefore some training program must be effectively being applied. And if the children are in command, of course, they are then bringing up father and mother rather than father, father and mother bringing them up. So when we find a home government in which, which to use the exact words here, the parents are ruling um, by the ascendancy of their physical power then what kind of kingdom is it? It's an earthly kingdom, which is a satanic kingdom. Now, of course, what uh, <clears throat> deceives parents in this respect is that they themselves can be, as I've seen it happen, truly born-again Christians who love the Lord very dearly, who obey His commandments to the best of their knowledge, who are daily receiving fresh supplies of grace from heaven, and therefore, without a shadow of doubt, the parents are in fact walking in God's ways and in their hearts the kingdom of grace has been established. Now, what is the natural conclusion that such parents would draw about the overall state of their homes? It is an, or a divine kingdom, right? But the fact still remains that if a parent is born again and yet employs and yet rules by the ascendancy of physical power over his children, over his and her children, then 
in actual effect what kind of government do we find in the home an earthly or a heavenly an earthly kingdom or in other words a satanic kingdom whereas <clears throat> from God's kingdom every carnal weapon every instrument of coercion is banished now <clears throat> this of course raises some problems which we'll look at in just a moment I'll turn now to page 758 in the book Desire of Ages on which page we have another statement along the same lines as the one which we have just read page 759 I'm sorry one page on from that page 759 in the book Desire of Ages Christ could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one can cast their pebbles of the earth but he did not do this rebellion was not to be overcome by force compelling power is found only under Satan's government only under Satan's government therefore it is never found under divine government therefore in a home where divine government has been established and this of course is God's intention God certainly has not planned or provided for any home to be governed in the satanic way or to be a, a, an earthly kingdom every Christian home in God's plan is to be a divine kingdom and can be a divine kingdom no question about that so therefore if it's a divine kingdom then compelling power is not found in that earthly government because that is found only under Satan's government now <laughs> the young people in this movement of course were quick, quicker to see this than we were I remember that um, in certain families around the world there was one down in Idaho in particular I'm thinking of and another one down in Australia the children came to the meetings and listened to the character of God studied and they said right they said to their parents God doesn't punish and neither can you <laughs> <laughs> and they were right they were all too right at the time of course we, we didn't have the complete answer for them because um, back then we recognized that if we withdrew the hand of force from children in whom is the spirit of disobedience we'd have a worse situation still in fact I understand that Dr. Benjamin Spock that very famous pediatrician wrote some books about 25 or 30 years ago in which he very strongly advocated that children should not be punished they should be allowed to grow up and express themselves express what's in them and I believe that many many thousands of parents took his advice and left their children unrestrained undisciplined last year I am told I haven't yet seen this in actual print I'm, I would love to get this in actual black and white Dr. Spock repudiated every one of those principles why? because his children had grown up to be little desperados criminals in fact with uh, confrontations with the police and some, some of them I believe have spent time in prison others were heavy on drugs and uh, other problems along those lines and so Dr. Spock said it didn't work so so far then we find ourselves faced with two alternatives one is the removal of every weapon of coercion from our family government and the other is the consequences which Dr. Spock seemed to well didn't did not seem to but actually reaped and there's a situation of anarchy of a spirit of rebellion run absolutely wild and loose so then what do we do well most some folk would say well we better stay with with the rod after all Solomon said spare the child uh, spare the rod and spoil the child or spare the child and spoil the rod <laughs> well that's the alternative isn't it and of course people often bring this particular question up to me when I present these principles and I talk about uh, the fact that every divine government is one marked by the absence of weapons of coercion uh, the use of compelling power to produce obedience now what, is, uh, what has been overlooked both by Dr. Spock and Christian parents for apparently millennia is that there's another factor which is very vital in this whole drama and the other factor is that before a child can become a member of a divine kingdom and therefore be ruled by divine principles he must become qualified for that kind of government and the qualification is an inward condition not just a mental training or attitude it's a qualification achieved not by training but by regeneration it's a condition that can be achieved in no other way but that 
and a condition which must be achieved at the very earliest possible moment. The earlier, of course, it is achieved, then the better it is for both the child and the parent concerned. <clears throat> Every child is conceived with the spirit of disobedience. Now this is an expression I now use because I find it is much more meaningful to parents than to simply talk about the carnal mind, the old man of sin, the offspring of Satan, the seed of, seed of the devil and so forth. But it's all the same thing. As I said today, a spirit is a life force. A life force is a presence. It is an occupant, a tenant. And more than just a tenant, of course, it's a dominating ruling tenant in the human body. And so therefore when we are possessed by the spirit of disobedience we are a slave to its power. And only when that presence is eradicated and replaced by the spirit of obedience can a child function successfully in a divine kingdom. Now how much did Dr. Spock apparently know about this, this change from the spirit of, obedience, spirit of disobedience to the spirit of obedience? Obviously nothing. This of course is a principle untaught and unknown out there in the outside world and the general concept is, of course, that a child cannot be expected to respond to Christian principles and, and make a decision, bring about his own new birth experience until he has gained an age sufficient for this. In most cases, folks think of this as being at least uh, 15 or 16 years of age. But we shall find in the Word of God evidence to teach us that a child can be and is, is, is by far better off to be born again as soon as possible after conception before, long before it comes forth from the mother's womb of course the standard objection to this is well how can such an important question be determined by the parents doesn't everyone in this world have to make the decision for themselves but that uh, objection ignores the principle laid down by God when God himself instructed Israel to dedicate their children to him to make decisions by which they brought them up in the ways of God after all said and done when you as a Christian parent decide to take your child to church and, to, and have him go to Sabbath school when you teach him memory verses aren't you making decisions for him decisions he can't make for himself and the answer is obviously yes now the statement which I use to prove that parents do have this right and more than just a right they're expected by God to do it is found on page 50 in the book Desire of Ages page 50 in the book Desire of Ages about 40 days after the birth of Christ Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord and to offer sacrifice this was according to the Jewish law and as man substitute Christ must conform to the law in every particular. He had already been subjected to the rite of circumcision. Now let me stop right there and ask you a question. We just read that the dedication of Christ took place 40 days after his birth. When did his circumcision take place? Eight days, eight days right? So here's a baby eight days old. At that age how much capacity capacity does he have to make a decision none whatsoever can he and therefore he cannot dedicate himself to obey or pledge himself to obey the law of God but now note these words very carefully he had already been subjected to the rite of circumcision as a pledge of his obedience to the law so at the age of eight a pledge was made that Jesus Christ would obey the law of God did he make it on his own behalf? Definitely not. Who made, the, who made the pledge for him? His parents did. But that pledge counted as if he'd made it for himself. Right? And that absolutely demonstrates the fact that parents do have the right, the responsibility and the privilege of making those vital decisions for their children. And right now, those, you all heard something of the ch children's salvation message, of course. For many of you it's a review, and I trust a very helpful and blessed review. Right now, don't you wish with all your heart and soul that 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, as the case may be, your parents had made that choice for you and brought you a new birth experience before you were even born? Absolutely. I wish my parents had done it. With all my heart, I wish they'd done it. I'd be a much more efficient and more powerful Christian than I ever am at this present time, and so would you be. 
So gladly would we, would we endorse the decision made by our parents. Now of course as the child um, grows up and intelligence dawns and the child is able to make decisions at first of course on a very limited scale but in, with increasing responsibility as the years go by the child then has the privilege of deciding whether he wants to confirm or to deny the decision made by his parents. So in the ultimate, who makes that decision? In the ultimate, the child himself. Which brings us back of course to the principle that everyone in the end must make his own decision to be saved. It can't be made by his parents in, in finality. Now let's turn now to some of the great promises found in the word of God in regard to what God will do for our children. Let's turn to Isaiah 49 and verse 25. Isaiah 49 and verse 25. And this is certainly a very wonderful declaration made by the God of heaven. Chapter 49 and verse 25. I really love this statement with all my heart and with all my soul. Actually, I'd like to go back to verse 24 and read it and verse 25. And the question is, shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? Now who is the prey referred to in this verse? And the answer is your children. That's made clear, of course, by the next verse which, which we shall read in just a moment. The context confirms that. And who is the mighty one from whom this prey shall be taken? The devil. Now prey, of course, is, um, is the food upon which... Uh, uh, carnivorous animals feast it's also um, yes that's, that's the general use of the word and here Satan is symbolized or represented as being a ravenous devouring beast of prey and your children your beautiful children like lambs and lions mouth are the prey of this mighty one and the question is shall the prey be taken from the mighty now, the, the, unfortunately, the mighty one's been having an awful good feast over the centuries, has he not? Feeding upon our beautiful children. And it's absolutely time this thing was changed. So he's denied his food and goes away a very hungry old devil. Or the lawful captive delivered. Now, are we the lawful prey of Satan before, before we're born again? Yes. Absolutely. What made it a lawful situation for him, Adam's, cheap sellout in the Garden of Eden when Adam gave the human race into Satan's hand and it was done lawfully enough because Satan persuaded Adam and Eve to make this, this, this uh, surrender and so we passed lawfully into the hands of Satan although Satan of course had no legal right to tempt man in the first case verse 25 but thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him who contends with you, and I will save your children. And that, that's a promise for every parent, is it not? I will save your children. We might at this point stress the point that uh, God has a a plan of salvation which is applied to every single human need. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it's, whether it's mental, physical or spiritual. Jesus Christ has one plan, one provision which brings salvation to parents and children alike. Now when for instance the Lord says I will save you, we think of the plan of salvation. When he says I will save your children we don't tend to think of the plan of salvation we tend to think rather of God's protecting care about them to provide them with physical deliverance from the physical peril that they face from day to day but let me stress tonight that uh, there's only one way to bring salvation to your children and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ the power of God to save from sin let's turn for a moment to Romans chapter 1 again keeping your finger in Isaiah 49 verse 25 We'll come back there in just a second or two. And if I, if I can bring just one thought to your minds tonight, it is this, that, that at their disposal, parents have the awesome power of God's salvation plan whereby to bring into effect the salvation of their children. As we saw two nights ago, we read from Romans 1.16 where Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. 
But of course that means, does it not, to everyone over the age of 10, or should I say 15, or is it 20? Shall I read it that way? No. Shall I read it then, everyone over the age of 5? What about 3? 2? You're disagreeable. <laughs> 1 then. Well then, at birth. Right. At conception. Right. But you say to me, a child can't believe that that's conception, he doesn't have the capacity. What is being discovered is this, that um, every single experience in which the mother and the father pass before the child is born is experienced by the child. I mentioned earlier the, uh, the book I've been reading entitled The Secret Life of the Unborn Child and I recommend that uh, every parent secure a copy of this the last few chapters I, I don't recommend, they get off into other themes, but this book demonstrates the fact that every experience through which the father and mother pass, the, the unborn infant also passes. So then if the father and the mother are men, is a, uh, if the father and the mother is a man and woman of faith, of living faith, if that person, if the father and the mother believe under salvation, then what is the unborn infant also doing? He's believing too. Make no mistake about it, he's believing too. And if the father and mother are skeptics, doubters, and so forth, then what is the child doing? He's also being skeptical and doubting and so forth, and will emerge, of course, in the world in that fashion. Now, this book demonstrates the fact with some very fine um, case histories and so forth, and uh, experiments and the results of them, that if the parents are divided, and contentious with each other, if they can't see eye to eye, then that is a terrifying experience for the unborn infant and builds in him a dreadful sense of security. And he comes into the world suspicious and uh, doubting and sceptical and above all very, very, very insecure. So that when the Word of God says that the Gospel is the power of God to everyone that believeth, that includes the unborn infant. If through his parents he's a believer, then the gospel is the power of God to save him from his sinfulness before he even emerges out into the outside world. And this is a great truth when once fully realised, of course, will place in the hands of parents a mighty weapon and will begin that training program which will, of course, result in the child when he grows up going in the way the Lord has called him to go. Now I forgot to make a point a little bit ago, that I must make at this moment before I lose track of it altogether, I did demonstrate that every home in which the weapons of coercion are used, every home which ruled by the ascendancy of physical power is a worldly kingdom and therefore a satanic kingdom. Now, and therefore a child trained under those principles from babyhood to early uh, teenagers who's being trained in a satanic kingdom is hardly being trained in the way of the Lord, is he? In fact, he's being trained the very opposite from the way of the Lord. Even though the parents have consoled themselves with the thought, well, look, I teach him memory verses, I take him to Sabbath school, I put him in church school, I surround him with sound habits of living, with good moral training and so forth, so therefore this is the right kind of training. But if the weapons of coercion are used to, to affect that training, it is a satanic kingdom. Now, do you expect then, or can you expect then to train up a child for 15 years in a satanic kingdom, kingdom and then expect him to continue on in God's kingdom. Does that make sense? Of course it doesn't. If you train a person, for instance, for 15 years in a certain way or procedure and then expect him to automatically and naturally turn over to an opposite way altogether, you're just simply expecting too much. It doesn't work that way. And therefore, a little thought will demonstrate that the outcome of what we thought was correct child training in that the children, generally speaking, there are exceptions, of course, in, every, in, in many cases, which is fortunate, otherwise we'd all be lost. So, but, but generally speaking, the outworking has been rebellion and, and uh, a departure from God's principles and ways. The parents should never have been surprised. They should have expected it and know it was coming on the basis of the kind of program they had instituted in their home governments. This means then that um, if the gospel, when God says, I will save your children, and if the gospel is the power of God to everyone that believeth, down to the unborn infant, 
And if the faith of the unborn infant is a reflection or a duplication of his parents' faith, and this means, of course, that every Christian parent must become a living preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Must be. From the, from the very, very earliest moments of, that, of their child's life until he finally passes out of their control and becomes his own responsibility. It means, of course, that every Christian parent must be a person with living faith, living faith that uh, is alive and well every single day, especially during the period when the child is being carried in the mother's womb. <coughs> Let me uh, note the statement in the book Education again, which is very challenging to us at this point of time. I have uh, This statement has stuck in my mind for the last 25 years or more because it has been to me both a reflection of my own failures and also a warning of where I must concentrate my efforts in, in improvement. Page 80 in the book Education reads as follows. It was not on the cross only that Christ sacrificed himself for humanity. As he went about doing good, every day's experience was an outpouring of his life. In one way only could such a life be sustained. Jesus lived in dependence upon God and communion with him. To the secret place, and here comes the main part of the paragraphs I want to draw attention to right now. The other is extremely important too, especially by way of comparison. To the secret place of the Most High, under the shadow of the Almighty, men now and then repair. What's not a, word, a single word you put in the place of now and then? Occasionally. Occasionally, yes. Another word yet? Intermittently. Right? Intermittently. Off and on. Now and then. They abide for a season, and the result is manifest in noble deeds, then their faith fails, the communion is interrupted and the life work marred. But the life of Jesus was a life of constant trust, sustained by continual communion, and his service for heaven and earth was without failure or faltering. Now can you identify that paragraph? I certainly can. This now and then factor in our lives. We uh, set up a program of communion with God and we begin well. First few mornings go by and we spend that half an hour or more with God in prayer. We very, very carefully and thoughtfully peruse the beautiful words of life in the book like Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, or perhaps a Bible book instead. And then one day we, we come home late and perhaps we, we Ill, uh, Ill advise to eat a little bit too heavy a supper. We don't sleep too well. When, when the time comes to rise, we have a thick head and we feel like... Um, you know, like a, a, log, a bag of lead or something, and we just don't want to get up, and we don't get up, and the communion is marred, we finally rush out of bed at the last minute, eat a hasty breakfast and charge off to work. And of course the day doesn't go very well at all. And then once the pattern is broken, it takes us quite some time to get back to it again, and very often we don't get back because of extreme busyness or the like. And there's this on and off, uh, pattern so far as we humans are concerned now if you fail generally speaking in life in this pattern do not do so during the nine months the baby is being carried because that child needs a good start in life not an off and on business it needs consistency in his parents life remember again that as the parent communes with God so does the unborn baby absolutely every experience the father and mother experience together during the pregnancy is, is experienced by that little child and experiences educate and of course that's when the child is most malleable and that's during those nine months uh, that is when the molding process goes on and the mold is placed upon that child that uh, is far more lasting and permanent than anything else which happens for the rest of its life and this is something which we need to stress in our minds and realize better than we do at the present time so then, during that nine month period, this uh, should be maintained very carefully. I heard a little while ago of a mother, for instance, who, uh, who was uh, not doing too well during the pregnancy and uh, her fourth child was coming and she had loads and loads of time to read and she, she read nothing but Bible and spirit, spirit of Prophecy during that period of time. And when her baby was born, it had a peculiar, a, a peculiar loveliness of disposition. And, she, and the mother told me that never once in, in the 15 or 16 years before that girl finally left home did she ever have to punish her at all. She, she was naturally obedient. 
and there was a beautiful relationship between the two. So then, how fast the time goes by, we're running out of time already. Let's then um, come back to Isaiah 49 and verse 25 where the Lord says, But thus saith the Lord, Even the captives and the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. Now it doesn't say, God doesn't say, I'll go down there and do war with the mighty and the terrible one, and uh, hopefully I'll win. At least I'll do my best. God doesn't say that. He says, Even the captives and the mighty shall be taken away. Is that positive language? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a guarantee, it's a certain thing. And the prey of the terrible shall be delivered, for I will contend with him who contends with you, and I will save your children. Salvation is, is by the gospel, and salvation is by faith. Unless living faith is there, the victory, of course, shall not be gained. Now, if parents don't believe, or don't know, and therefore don't believe, that uh, their faith is picked up by their unborn infant and exercised by their unborn infant exactly as the parents exercise in the same faith, then of course they can't have faith to have their child delivered. But if they know these things and knowing them exercise that kind of faith and sweet confidence in God's saving power, then of course their children will enjoy the blessings of faith and the blessings of deliverance which come with that. Let's turn back now, now to Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 18. And here is a very thrilling promise indeed, one that must warm the heart of every parent as we sit here tonight. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 18. Behold, I am the children whom the Lord hath given me <clears throat> are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Now in the book Christ Object Lessons, page 196, we have a comment on this particular statement which is likewise a very beautiful one and most encouraging to every parent gathered here this evening. Page 196 in the little book Christ Object Lessons. The, the, the children here, of course, can be applied to... Um, I'll go page 195 and 196. The children here could be referred, of course, in a spiritual sense, but Sister White does apply it in the actual physical sense, our actual physical offspring. She says there are fathers and mothers who long to labour in some foreign mission field. There are many who are active in Christian work outside the home while their own children are strangers to the Saviour and his love. Now what a tragedy. Think about it. Here's the parents running around trying to convert the world while the children are strangers to the Saviour and his love. Is that a picture of born-again children? Anything but. <clears throat> The work of winning their children for Christ, many parents trust to the minister or the Sabbath school teacher, but in doing this they are neglecting their own God-given responsibility. Now I have opportunities as I travel the world to approach the children and talk to them about their conversion and to lead them to, to Jesus Christ. This I will not do, because that's the parents' responsibility. I will train the parents, but the parents themselves must lead their child to the Saviour. That is their work. And it's very important that the parents do this because as you've learned there's always a very special bond a, a very close tie of love between the person who brings you the good news of salvation and yourself and therefore because above all there should be bonding as, as close as possible between the parent and the child the parent then should be the one to bring that experience to their child and thus the parent and the child are bonded together I believe in Malachi, the fourth chapter, this is what is meant when it says that the fathers, I'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the ch uh, heart of the children to their fathers. And what is more wonderful than to have a family in which there is this beautiful bonding between parent and parent and between parents and children? So the love which binds us here in this camp meeting is, is the same kind of glorious love which binds the hearts of parents and children together. So parents, rise to your responsibilities, rejoice in the fact that you can become gospel preachers, bring the gospel to your children and bind them to your hearts in consequence. The education and training of their children to be Christians is the highest service that parents can render to God. Think about that. Let me read it again. The education and training of their children to be Christians is the highest service that parents can render to God. What is the 
page 195 Christ Object Lessons, right, 195. Now, of course, there has been too much in the past of an emphasis placed upon parents getting out and winning the world around about them before they win the world right inside their own doorsteps. And, of course, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that's been a very strong emphasis. It is a work which demands patient labour, a lifelong, diligent and persevering effort. By a neglect of this trust, <clears throat> we prove ourselves unfaithful stewards. No excuse for such neglect will be accepted by God. So his promise and his also warning. So, <clears throat> I must say, if I had realised 20 and 30 years ago, what I realise now, I would never have gone out and given a single Bible study until I was quite satisfied my children were walking in the ways of God. Read a little further. But those who have been guilty of neglect are not to despair. The woman whose coin was lost says till she found it. So in love, faith and prayer, let parents work for their households until with joy they can come to God saying, Behold, I am the children whom the Lord has given me. Isaiah 8 and verse 18. This is true home missionary work and it is as helpful to those who do it as to those for whom it is done. By our faithful interest for the home circle we are fitting ourselves to work for the members of the Lord's family with whom, if loyal to Christ, we shall live through eternal ages. For our brethren and sisters in Christ we are to show the same interest that as members of one family we have for one another. So true home missionary work is the privilege then of parents being gospel preachers to their children, both those unborn and those yet to be born. I mean those unborn and those already born. Because the unborn are, are those who yet to be born. Get myself mixed up there a little bit. Now tomorrow morning as our time has virtually gone for now, I want to talk about the expression the children are for signs and for wonders in Israel, says, says the Lord of hosts. And that brings to view the fact, of course, that the true sign and the true wonder is regeneration. That is the sign which marks the presence of Jesus Christ as God's mission into this world and is the witness to us that he has indeed come to us in saving power. And I do consider today that the subject of child salvation to be the most important theme that we have at the present time. We could never have understood this without the character of God lessons, without the Sabbath rest lessons and without of course the basic gospel message as well. And now having first given us all those fundamentals, God can now teach us how to be effective missionaries in our own home and bring salvation to our children, both born and as yet unborn. We'll leave our theme there for the moment and pick it up again tomorrow morning when we'll continue this as we look further into the subject of child salvation and child training. <laughs>